like also just <laughs> All right. So I think there's just so much great energy surrounding your book right now, right? I mean, I saw the picture of Kelly Marie Tran <laughs> wearing um, your cover art at the Gold House Gala. Um, and it doesn't get much cooler than that, right? Um, how has the reception for your book been so far? It's been phenomenal. I mean, uh, yes, that moment was actually, I think, the crowning moment of a pretty fantastic journey so far. Uh, it, it literally was Rose Tico in Rise. <laughs> she, she actually had uh, our book cover, the, the, uh, the face art, as it were, printed on a jumpsuit, a pair of jumpsuits that she and her boyfriend wore to this ginormous gala full of celebrities on the red carpet, on the stage, etc. So, uh, Again, it's we could not have asked for more. But I think it was also her statement. She was so great when she, she came to us a couple weeks before the event. And she was like, uh, "I want to wear, I want to, I want to wear that art on, on me because the because the, the cover art itself is actually trying to highlight the many many faces who make up uh, Asian America and." Um, a lot of these people have are trailblazers, pioneers in their own right. She wanted to celebrate that in her own way because that's what the event was. So mm. it was a statement. And, uh, it was a pretty great one. I, I think the only annoying thing for her must have been people kind of pointing their faces out in different parts of her body. It's like, oh, I'm in your knee over here. <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, uh, I, I think the best thing actually about the, the book and this tour has been literally gatherings like this uh, and being able to have conversations with people because the reason why we, we've been barnstorming this, like driving from city to city, like minor league baseball team members or something, um, has been because more than anything else, we wanted to hear how people were connecting with it, the kinds of conversations are sparking, and especially, I will say, uh, seeing parents and, and kids together, because we've been hearing a lot of people saying, when I bought it, I want to read it, but my kid grabbed it out of my hands first. And that, you know, that that's something which, uh, we had both hoped for, but also could not plan, so. Yeah, um, so let's let's start with your inspiration for the book, uh, which you touch upon in the introduction, which is this beautiful like comic book panel. Um, the art in this book is just so beautiful, but what inspired you to create this book? What, what do you think was like missing in the cultural landscape that made you believe this book was a necessity? Well, you know, uh, I, I'm going to have to say that the origin story of the book begins in 2018, actually, uh, before this, this thing we call the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> 2018 was a signal year for Asian America because this was the year that a lot of popular culture actually discovered Asians. Uh, there was a, a little movie called Crazy Rich Asians, which came out. Uh, maybe some of you watched it. it. It attracted not just blockbuster box office, but the kind of attention that comes with a real milestone in, in culture. That is to say, people writing stories like, this is a milestone in culture. <laughs> and the way they framed it was always, not in the past 25 years has there been a Hollywood movie with an all Asian American cast. Not since Joy Luck Club has there been something like this. And the way that read, and it's actually our, our, our third co-author, Philip Wong of, of Wong Fu Productions. Um, I saw somebody was wearing a Wong Fu sweatshirt, which, you know, We'll just say she, he's here in spirit. Uh, but uh, he, he frequently commented in, in conversations with me and with, with Phil that whenever he saw that stuff, it really felt like people were saying that Hollywood you know, kind of tossed us a bone with Joy Luck Club and then Asian Americans sat around sucking their thumbs for 25 years until they reached back and decided to bless us again with a Hollywood movie. And that's not what it was like at all. And, and, and that more than anything else, I think, started the conversations that led us to want to write this book. Yeah, I think it's definitely, um, it definitely those articles. Like, it's, it feels like every article that was written about Fraser Fraser Jadens in like the opening paragraph had to they were legally obligated to note like this was the first movie starring all Asians in twenty five years. You know, every the, the refrain got a little tiring, and we were like, look, that that really does make it sound like we were doing nothing. And as people who were commentators and watchers and makers of, of what we saw as Asian American culture. Um, and maybe so mainstream didn't pick up on that. Mainstream wasn't like uh, celebrating that. We knew it was happening. So a lot of our conversations were like about um, a lot of the kind of 
things that um, Asian Americans really knew and celebrated, um, like the rise of YouTube creators that were like predominantly an Asian American, like like Wong Fu Productions. Um, and we thought, like, you know, when people make a montage, like news outlets make a montage of like, here are the great moments of Asian American representation, you know, they'll put up all these Hollywood movies, but they might not include like YouTube video and you know, creators online and um, little subcultures that we all knew about. Um, and I thought like, well, that's a real shame, you know, and, and Phil Bit also expressed as well, like, you know, it, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of sad that uh, the YouTube generation that he came up with probably wouldn't get as recognized as say something like Grace for Asians, you know, where, but if we know, we know there's a generation that grew up watching that stuff that felt like they could see themselves in something like YouTube when Hollywood wasn't really doing the job. And so we had a lot of conversations where we ended with like, you know, somebody should write a book about that. <laughs> like somebody, should, somebody should write, make a documentary about that little subculture of Asian America. That was a really cool time. And then you say that enough times, like, oh, somebody should do this, somebody should do that. I think we kind of came around to the conclusion, like, well, maybe we should write that. <laughs> <laughs> we did. So it was like a question of like visibility then for you or for cementing this down in something tangible? Yeah, because, you know, uh, actually, Philip, well, Phil says this a lot. Uh, you don't know that you're a part of history when you're actually living it. But there was so much that we did live through in the 90s, and the 2000s and the 2010s that ended up being pivotal and, and critical to the shaping of who we are as Asian Americans. Uh, and that's not entirely coincidental. Uh, I, I think the way that we ended up seeing it as we started to build the proposal for the book was recognizing that these three decades were particularly important because they were the ones in which multiple generations of Asian Americans who were actually born into Asian America grew up or, or came of age, right? And what you mean by that is, you know, the term Asian American is actually relatively novel. There have been Asians in America for since before there was an America. Like in the 1500s, there were Filipino sailors who swam off Spanish galleons and set up communities on shore. And, and again, you know, those were Asians in America, uh, or maybe specifically Filipinos in America. But that whole idea of what it means to be Asian American doesn't begin with those stories, because there are a lot of people who are Asian in America who don't think of themselves as Asian American. Uh, my parents don't think of themselves as Asian American, right? They think of themselves as you know, Taiwanese, sometimes Chinese, mostly when they talk about America, just American, right? But the idea of a pan-Asian, pan-ethnic, Asian American community actually begins in, well, 1968. And, uh, and, and that happens to be the year I was born. Yeah, I was gonna say, I remember that from the book, you said that you're born in the year. It's that like it's, being the born the term is coined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so 1968 was when, when the term Asian American was coined. And so that means that we've, we've had from 68 to now, basically, you know, three generations or so of people who have uh, been asked what it means to be Asian American, who have been defined by the term, who've had to check off the box, right? Without necessarily knowing the answer of what it means, because they were the ones who had to actually answer that question for themselves, who had to come up with answers for that question themselves. And so that's kind of what the book is about. It's about that process that we took, the journey we took from being an empty box to filling it with stories, with narratives, with experiences, uh, and with connections with one another to the point where now it feels kind of like Asian American means something. And I think it was important for us also to. Like we could have, we could, like we could have a really great discussion about all this, but like if it's not, if it's all, if it's not all collected in a book, I feel like there's something that really legitimizes those experiences, you know. And um, we wanted something that really that canonizes, you know, that categorizes, and canonizes these stories and um, tell a, told a story of Asian America. You know? At the heart of it, really, is this question: Who gets to tell our stories? Right? Who? Who gets to determine which of those stories are told in the first place? You know, and for far too long, I think that uh, that those decisions were made by somebody else about our journey. You know? Whether it's Hollywood, whether it's the government, whether it's you know, we, you know, I, I think this was an attempt to take that narrative back and have some agency in the way that story is told. Um, I would argue that a lot of the things that we're seeing in the news right now and the things the way we talk about Asian Americans. 
there's this moment of like hyper visibility after being so invisible, invisible lives for so long. A lot of that actually has to do with the fact that we were so ignored, our stories were not told, we're not taught in schools. Uh, we come to a place where all of a sudden people are realizing there are Asians in this country and they have a story, but nobody knows how to do that. No one knows how to talk about that, right? And so this book is an attempt to uh, capture that in, in, or at least be a starting point. For mm. Yeah, the book, like the description of the book, it says it's a love letter to Asian Americans. And I mean, one of the spaces that I really felt like it it was a love letter were the the spaces sections. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was really nostalgic for me to see the depiction of the Asian home. Yeah. Just reminded me of things I saw in homes growing up, things that probably all of us have seen um, that I didn't really see as maybe like Asian until I went to my classmates' houses and I'm like, oh, they don't like have this here. You know, <laughs> like um, using plastic containers as Tupperware, the <laughs> neatly flattened aluminum foil for reusing, um, kitchen scissors, like, you know, what Asian household doesn't have kitchen scissors for noodles, right? Um, and the dishwasher being used as a drying rack, right? Um, how is it like compiling these pieces um, in those spaces? Well, so uh, I should describe a little more about what the spaces are. And, yeah. and then I'll, I have actually a visual aid for something else, which is uh, when, when people ask, what's my favorite piece in the book? I always have this one answer, which is why we blew it up and put it on cardboard. <laughs> um, but um, so the spaces, uh, and, and props, by the way, to our editor, Annie Shu, Asian American editor, understood, she got it from the beginning and, and you know probably understood the book better than we did, frankly, when we started. Uh, she let us do everything we ever wanted, including these things called spaces, which are, are double gatefolds folded out, four pages, widescreen illustrations of different parts of Asian American life, different parts of our experience that uh, serve as kind of a window into our world. That's because the book isn't just a pop culture library or, or our timeline of, of the evolution of our media and entertainment presence. When we say pop history, we don't mean pop culture alone, we mean popular history. Uh, this is the history of our people and our, our, our people's experience. And, and we wanted to invite people who weren't Asian American to step into those worlds. Just take off your shoes, please. Uh, so uh, the spaces are things like uh, depictions of Asian homes, Asian groceries, bubble tea shops or boba shops, if you go that way. Uh, you know, a night out of K-Town, uh, life during COVID, Asian American culture festivals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, again, we annotated them collectively. Uh, Very tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, because, you know, the idea is that we wanted these to be nostalgic for us, but welcoming to others or open to others. And, and then there was this one other spread that really did summarize that as well. It was kind of the one that actually led to us creating the spaces. And it's, it's this one, it's the, the one we call Stuff Asians Like. <laughs> so uh, Stuff Asians Like actually was the, the origin point for, for this idea of spaces because we actually began it as kind of this crowdsourced exercise on Twitter, on social media, right? Where uh, we were musing on this. And we asked uh, our, our expanded social networks, what is the most Asian, non-Asian thing you can think of? the thing that Asians have adopted and made Asian. <laughs> and, uh, and these are the answers that they gave us. Our, and one of our incredible illustrators, Shingen Kaur, created kind of this mosaic of items. Um, and, uh, and these represent things that people said, these are the things, the non-Asian things that I grew up with that I kind of always thought were Asian because they were in our house and we live with them, we love them. If you'd like to point some out, Phil. Yes, Costco, <laughs> uh, KFC. Racket sports, <laughs> uh, real luxury goods, fake luxury goods, uh, house slippers, Adidas slides. <laughs> Adidas, every time we've actually shown this off, there's been somebody in the audience actually wearing Adidas slides. Who's like, yeah, you got me, you got me. Uh, we got Spam, of course, Toblerone, Supreme. I, I, I always have an issue with the Supreme. Uh, Brown liquor. <laughs> and of course, the, you know, the great unifier. Oh, yes. Uh, so this was the one, actually, that everybody kind of gravitates towards and says, ah, yes. Not just among Asian Americans, but like across cultures. This is the, the blue tin of Danish butter cookies that actually does not contain butter cookies. Yes. 
It contains usually like sewing supplies. Yes. 80% of the time, it's sewing. Yeah. Who's the one that went around told everybody you've got to be sewing? I love this because um, we have an audiobook version of the book as well. And the narrator, when he got to the section, he, it's, you know, it's just an illustrated list, but he's like, he's hype. He's like, South Asians like Costco. <laughs> The reason, uh, the reason why actually I, I love this spread and, and why we, and I think a lot of other people gravitate towards it is because there's something really kind of interesting about uh, what it says. And what it says is that our Asian American identity is not hinged on actually being Asian. Because there, again, there are no Asians in Asia. There are Chinese and Japanese and Filipinos and Koreans and Vietnamese. There's a lot of people who don't necessarily always get along and certainly don't necessarily feel like they have a lot in common it actually hinges on the second part of the phrase, American, right? Our Asian American identity is about our American identity and our Asian American history is American history. And when we see the ways in which we've actually consumed America and in that way made America Asian, we recognize that, we see that in the mirror. The stuff Asians like, right, in America are the things that we, especially as immigrants and post-immigrants, these are the things that we actually found to be kind of part of the bounty of this country. And in that, in the course of embracing those things, of consuming those things, uh, of discovering those things, we discovered a path to become a part of this country. And, and that to me is always kind of a beautiful story about what this book ultimately is about. Yeah, I was thinking a lot about like what you were just saying with this idea of spaces and, and, and you know, many of us, you know, have immigrant parents or immigrants ourselves. Um, and in the book you write about when talking about A Magazine, it seemed like we were surrounded by a startling array of offbeat, outspoken, and idealistic Asian American artists, activists, entrepreneurs, and organizers. Most of them, like us, were children of immigrants and students of the first wave of Asian American studies steeped in the striver ethics of our hardworking parents, but rebelling against the burden of expectations they placed on our shoulders, right? This kind of in-between generation. I was just kind of wondering, like, how do you think Asian American culture will shift as we get further away from the generation of immigrants? Or do you think there's going to be a shift? It's a great question. <laughs> uh, well, I'll answer, that, I'll answer that a little bit by, by saying that the, the book, uh, in many ways, encapsulates a transition. It, it encapsulates this transition between uh, Asian American as a primarily political label and one which is now a cultural label and, and even a social one. It's one where people gather together because of being Asian American, right? When people ask us how we know each other, how we got to be friends, like. From being Asian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, that's the transition. Uh, beyond these three generations, and even at the tail end of those three generations, you get to a place where, uh, where being Asian American just feels like kind of part of the air you breathe, right? Where it's like this, the skin you're in. And I, I, I see that a lot actually with my own kids where they don't think as much about being Asian American because it's just a, it's just a part of them, right? It's just, it's natural to them. And, and that hasn't ever been the case for me, even now, right? I have to actually be very consciously Asian American because there's so much in my past history where I've been kind of told that being Asian American was a liability, was an obstacle, was a limiting force. And meanwhile, I think th this next generation isn't just more comfortable with being Asian American, they see it as kind of an advantage, a cool thing, a thing that connects them to this whole world of opportunities that for, for me were, were things that made me different and therefore isolated me. You know, the book is, you dedicate the book, Dedication is uh, this is for the ones who come next, right? We're specifically talking about people coming up, our kids, the next generation of Asian Americans who are going to be the movers and shakers, <coughs> creators, or anything like that. <laughs> we also we also hold it up as like this is your this is your document, this is your blueprint. Also, it was really hard getting you. <laughs> it was really hard. It's a lot easier for you. This, this is a, we went through a lot of stuff here today, here, so please recognize that. <laughs> Yeah, so, so what do you want those young readers to take from the book? Um, you know, 
we just recently passed our curriculum law. We're the second state to do so. Um, maybe we can get this book in some classrooms for <laughs> students starting next year. Um, I think the most important part is that Asian American history is American history, right? And we have for too long, at least when we were growing up, that history was just denied to us. Like it just, just completely erased or just, you know, a footnote in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's why Asian American history is like, as it is taught it, it, for many years and even now, like in the places as an elected, and it's not, it's not you know, sort of considered a, a, a mainstream telling of America, you know, where, and I think that our hope um, is that this book really um, is a reclamation in a lot, a lot of ways and is making up for lost time. And I hope that, that people do, like young people read this book and realize like, this is how we got here. This is our, all, this is our history um, and it is worth telling. And uh, yeah, it's, it, you know, and also, it was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, there's a reason why, like, it's, you know, maybe a third comics and, a, you know, vividly, colorfully illustrated. We are straight up out there, like, hoping to indoctrinate your kids. <laughs> Just like, we're out there. We want people to understand and see hum Asian Americans as human beings, including us as Asian Americans. We want, we want uh, younger Asian Americans to, to, to look at their world, to look at the world of their parents and their grandparents and, and see something that, uh, represents a multifaceted way of reflecting them, not just the single images they see in, in the media that other people have created for us, but ones which hopefully show kind of the vast diversity of our expanded culture. And, and to that point, I mean, even when we started writing this book, the very first thing we had to do was look at each other, right? And say, all right, you have here three guys, literally three guys, right? Three East Asian guys at that, three you know, cis, straight, East Asian guys who are parents. Uh, and that meant that we ourselves didn't have all the stories. And uh, it didn't help that it was like three East Asian guys, two of whom were named Phil. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> we're like, how long from Phil, America? <laughs> <laughs> Not Filipino. <you know>. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, given that, uh, in order to actually make this book, we, we knew we had to reach out to as broad a network as possible, contributors, of creators, of illustrators and storytellers. And, and we did that. We, we, we went out and found everybody who we aspirationally wanted to work with or had in the past worked with, and we brought them together for this. This really did take a, a village. And uh, every single person who we reached out to who wanted to participate in the book brought their own story and their own pitch and said, I'll do that, but you have to do this too which is why this book is 500 pages and like 30 pounds. <laughs> it was a, a, no joke, originally supposed to be 300 pages and it just kept on expanding, kept on getting bigger because we were like, we gotta put this in. Oh, did we forget about, we gotta put this in. And it just kept getting, and again, bless our editor, Jenny Shu, who just kept on being like, okay. <laughs> and they just alluded to that tone, the heavy tone that you, you have your answer. Uh, as an example of that, right? So, um, you know, early on, we'd reached out to one of our friends, Sujata Day, uh, YouTuber. She was on Insecure. And uh, she had just completed filming a movie called Definition Please, an indie movie starring herself, actually, and some incredibly talented folks. And uh, the premise of the movie was about uh, the protagonist, an adult woman herself, right, who had kind of peaked too early. She was a spelling bee champion at age eight, right? And that was at the high point of her life. And we'd actually reached out to her to do a roundtable on Harold and Kumar with the creators of, of that franchise. Uh, and she's like, I would love to talk with Harold and Kumar. It was like world changing, game changing, life changing for me. Uh, you know, Asian American stoners needed to be represented on screen. <laughs> um, but then she was like, but if you're going to do that, there's this other story you got to tell. And it is the story of South Asians and spelling bees. And I'm not going to tell it because I'll do this Harold and Kumar thing. But I'm introducing you to Hiba Ansari, a friend of mine who actually I based this character on. She's the one who peaked too early as a spelling bee champion. And so we, we actually gave her the space to tell her story uh, and illustrate it as a graphic essay. Uh, and, and it's kind of brilliant because it shows not just her own story, but the larger one of why South Asians 
gravitated towards spelling bees as kind of their, their uh, sport of choice <laughs> uh, and dominated it, right? Uh, so anyway, that's how the story grew with the telling, so to speak. Yeah, I, I mean, I love all the stories that are told um, in the book. I mean, there's so many examples of Asian excellence, uh, but there are also these postcards from Asian America that you include um, written by Asian Americans about their experience of being Asian. There's these stories of like not fitting in, feeling different, of struggle, but you know, rising and claiming their identity as their own, stories about all these different intersections of identity in particular. There's a lot of stories um, regarding that, about them building their own traditions. So where did these letters come from and what was it like reading through them and, and deciding what would go into the book? I think um, those, the, the postcards from Asian America pair really well with the, um, another feature called uh, the Asian American Atlas, which is basically an illustrated map of the United States and pointing out um, historical points of interest in Asian American history. Like, like the, the, point, the idea is that you could actually visit each of these these uh, sites um, that mean something, and so my 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 hope was that you could see you could also characterize Asian America as a place, as a physical place you know, that we occupy space in this country, um, and so the, the postcards actually were are uh, were an attempt actually to make sure that Asian America wasn't just represented by by coastal uh, sort of like coastal representation, I suppose, right? Because that's where we that's where we're heavily represented, you know, act like physically. We're just there, you know, and we wanted to spread that around and make sure people knew like Asian Americans are across the United States in the most, you know, maybe what you would think is an unlikely place. Make sure those stories are also highlighted in one of them. And, but, and, and sort of force um, the commonalities between them as well. But what's interesting is as you actually spread out across that atlas, across the map, and invite Asian Americans to send in postcards, you know, we ask people to just share pictures of themselves. A very, you know, a kind of brief description of how they grew up, where they were, when they kind of understood and engaged with the idea that they were Asian American. What we found out was when you look at that full gamut of Asian America, you see something very, very different from even the pictures you see in media and in entertainment. You see intersectionality, multiracial identities, adoptees. You see people who are disabled. You see people who are. Uh, you know, living in deep rural areas, you see people who are migrants and secondary migrants and refugees. I mean, there's like this full gamut of peoples that we could have done an entire book just on the postcards we received. And, uh, and, and frankly, I'm so glad we had it in the book because it enabled us to expand even just our, our kind of locus of Asian America, because so many of the, to, to, Phil's, to Phil's point, so many of the things that people think of as being the milestone events of Asian America have taken place in the New Yorks and San Francisco's and LA's of the world. But the, in a lot of ways, the heart of Asian America is spread broadly uh, across all 50 states. And, and we wanted to make sure they were represented. Yeah, there were a lot of postcards from the South. Um, <laughs> in particular, there was one from a person named Mia who was a disabled Korean transracial adoptee from the South. And from that letter, they wrote, in fact, these days, I often feel more comfortable in Asian American spaces than I do in others. And I feel like since the start of the pandemic, like I have incredibly been, I've been craving those Asian American spaces, or those are the spaces that I feel the most safe or the most comfortable. Um, do you feel like this is, is true for you as well? Uh, I mean, I guess. I feel like that's a kind of a weird question to ask us because we live in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're always surrounded by like Asian people. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A little, a little bit of an Asian American bubble. <laughs> it's like for sure. Um, but there is something I think this this book um, comes at a very specific time where people might need this. You know, people want to see themselves in something, see that, and their families reflected in something. You know, the, the, the best reaction to the book that we've gotten actually for me has been people telling me that this, this is the book I wish I had when I was growing up. I see myself in this, you know, and maybe they'll pick a specific thing in the, in the book where, like, oh my gosh, this was my, I thought I was the only one. This is a thing, you know, I write, I, there's recognition. You know, and when I was writing the book, when I, my thesis, and 
whenever I sat down to write it, <coughs> I kind of, for me, I felt like I was writing for other Asian Americans. I hope other people, I, the book is for everybody, but when I was writing, I was like, I want, I want other Asian Americans to see themselves in what I'm writing right now. I hope that recognition is there. And so to answer your question, I think, um, I, hope, I, put, I hope that the book itself is kind of a, a space where, yeah, I think we're, are we opening up to Q&A soon um, or not yet? Yeah, it's about time. Uh, you want to segue there? Okay, my my last question, yeah. I guess, is for me, I kind of wanted to know what your favorite scene from Everything Everywhere All at Once was. <laughs> Um, I love that movie. I, I think it's the best movie I've ever seen. Um, so I was just wondering, yeah, what what you love about the movie. I mean, you did, what, six podcast episodes about it, so. Six so far. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I will say, okay, so if you have not watched Everything Everywhere All at Once, uh, it's such a, a, a signal movie for our time, not least because it is this epic movie done in a very small budget, uh, which tells a very, very familiar story, right? It's a story of like intergenerational tension between a mother and a daughter uh, in, in the context of an immigrant family. But it does so with like just wild pyrotechnics and, and utter absurdity, you know, hot dog fingers and, you know, and uh, uh, I'm not gonna use terms that there are kids in the audience, but there are things <laughs> in the movie which, uh, which take it beyond the pale. and. Uh, it, it sums up where we are now, where we are, are not afraid of telling stories that are familiar, but we're telling them in completely unfamiliar and different and, and rich and complicated ways. And these aren't things where you could have walked into a studio and said, hey, I would love to do this story uh, about this immigrant woman who owns a laundry, who actually lives in an infinite number of multiverse spaces and can draw from superpowers from all of them at once, right? If you walked into a studio with that pitch, they'd be like, uh, thank you, we'll call you. And, and the fact is, they did this as an indie project. They pulled together, their Asian American producers helped pull together the financing for this. They sold it to kind of an enterprising mini studio, you know, uh, A24, which has been really great about discovering these sort of novel Asian American stories and platforming them. And they, they put it out there. And this thing has made a ton of, I mean, it's like, I mean, you know, it's the top, their top grossing film now top for A24. History yeah. For A24. Uh, okay, so the original answer. <laughs> my favorite, I think I have to say my favorite is probably uh, the uh, the fanny pack. Uh, that was mine, man. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, all right, I, I'll, I'll give you that one. All right. I mean, you said it though. <laughs> Go ahead, I'll think of something okay, else. Okay. So it's the fanny pack, it's the fanny pack attack, right? Uh, Ki Hoi Kwan, who is one of our favorites from childhood, he played short round in Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom, and then in The Goonies, he was Data, uh, and then disappeared for 20 odd years. He makes his return in this movie, and he he's amazing, he's brilliant, he's sweet and soft and vulnerable and also a badass. And he's both all at once, right? And in this one scene early on, he sort of obtains these martial arts powers by, again, connecting to another version of himself. And then, you know, this sort of unassuming middle-aged guy with glasses who wears a fanny pack, basically me, uh, <laughs> you know, use the fanny pack as, as, uh, as, as like a, a weapon to disable this, this armed force of police, of security guards who are trying to, to uh, arrest them. And, you know, it's just, it's a brilliant choreography, uh, but it's also the pivot that he goes through to, to go from like sort of pushing up his glasses to removing them, pulling off his fanny pack, and then just like going into high speed, uh, high speed, you know, action. It, it, I, we've, I've never seen anything like that before. And when I saw it on screen, I, I, I almost fell to my knees. <laughs> yeah, and he activates it right by biting the chap oh, the cha chapstick, right. which is so gross, it but is so gross. amazing. Um, my favorite part about that scene actually is right before it starts, is when Wayman looks at Evelyn and he just looks at he's like, "It's okay," and I'm like, <laughs> "He's back, baby." <laughs> uh, my favorite part actually is uh, is when um, Evelyn tells her father. This is Joy's girlfriend. Like, and it's just, I don't know. Like every time I see the movie a couple of times now, and like it it brings tears to my eyes. Uh, this moment of just 
a little bit of I, I see you for who you are, you know, like that's it's very special. Yeah, um... we, we should add, by the way, the father is James Hong. And if you don't know who James Hong is, you've probably seen him a million times. He's 93 years old and he just got his his star, his deserved star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So James Hong. Yeah. Amazing. Um, OK, so we'll open up to Q&A. <clears throat> Thank you so much for for being here. Sarah, and thank you so much, Michelle, for so ably uh, doing the moderating. I hate to interrupt, but um, we did promise a Q&A, and I feel certain that there are people in this audience who have questions. Just raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody? So. Uh... Obviously, I'm not Asian myself, but uh, yeah, I have mixed race children. I mean, we're, we're half Asian, half Caucasian. I mean, what uh, what advice would you give to my daughter sitting here today about how to balance being half in and half out of, of Asian America? I would say you're all in. I mean, you know, honestly, uh, we one of the things I think that Asian Americans have. Uh, have yet to fully contend with and explore is how intricate our community is and how inclusive we have to be to really be an Asian American community, right? Um, all of us, and we were just talking about this in, in, in waiting, you know, all of us have grown up in various ways being asked, you know, where are you from? <laughs> you know, what's your origin? People feel very comfortable trying to diagnose us and our Asianness. Uh, but it's even harder when you're multiracial. People want to know not just where you're from, but kind of what your algorithm is, right? <laughs> are you 35% or are you 49? You know, and, and the fact is, I've never felt like that is a good way of thinking about identity and culture. If you're a part of the community, it's because you've been embraced by the community and because you adopted it, you, you chose it for yourself. And that means that you aren't half in, half out, you're all in. And we're all in with you. And I, I think that, uh, you know, given that my family uh, is Asian American and white and black and Latinx, I've got people uh, in South America who are part of my extended family. I've got people who are in uh, a big branch actually, who are South Asian, uh, people who are connected to me both by blood and marriage. Uh, that's what our community looks like. And my advice, I guess, is, uh, this next generation in particular, I think has more opportunity to redefine what it means to be part of this community uh, and, and to make it more inclusive and make it more expansive because that's how we go beyond being seen as a quote unquote minority and into being seen as part of really the majority of the people on earth, right? Which is what we are as an Asian diaspora. I, I think also um, I am, absolutely a proponent of anyone identifying however they want for themselves. But personally, the way I, you know, the way you choose your words matters. And personally, I've stopped saying uh, to refer to someone who is biracial as like half Asian and half white. I just pers personally, um, I, I don't want to do that anymore. Uh, I believe you are fully both. So uh, I would, again, this is this, I'm not going to tell anybody how to describe themselves. But for myself, I just I decided to eliminate that kind of language from, you know, how I describe other people. Great. How about anybody else? Okay. Hi. Um, I am a fifth generation Chinese American and the mother of a sixth generation. Um, so I know your research, a lot of the work that you're doing is about, you know, because of the exclusion laws. Mm -hmm people who have only been here for three generations, but I just was wondering if, as you have collected people's stories, what's the difference between the third generation and the fifth and sixth generations from your perspective? It's a huge difference. I mean, I think that the people who were here first, you know, the, the Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Korean Americans, in some cases, uh, who were part of the very earliest ways of immigration, had it damn hard, you know? The, to get to this country in those times required not just incredible sacrifice, but kind of an acknowledgement that you were leaving behind so much more than you potentially might be facing 
You're leaving behind family. You're leaving behind uh, a sense of, of home and purpose. And you were coming to this country. I mean, the term for Chinese uh, settling in America were sojourners, right? They weren't settlers. They weren't people who expected to be here their entire lives. They were coming here to earn money maybe because you know it, it was they were stri stricken by poverty and war back in their, their countries uh, of origin. And so the existence I think of, of those earliest waves of, of uh, Chinese was so tenuous, you know? Uh, there was, before even exclusion, uh, there was this sense that Chinese were being brought to America very specifically for a purpose. And that purpose was to be kind of a, a wedge and counterweight to freed black slaves. Like all of a sudden you couldn't have free labor from black people, so let's get cheap labor from Asia, right? Uh, so there's like this whole legacy uh, of, of resistance and resilience that exists way before 1968 that we both acknowledge and, and talk about in this first chapter, which we call before. But then there's also the fact that when we talk about fifth, sixth, seventh generation peoples in America, the very fact that we can trace back lineage to that far back means that even as we talk about filling this box of Asian America, that box is only, only came to us empty because we didn't learn those stories. We didn't hear about what it meant to be you know, here before exclusion, here before uh, the, the you know, kind of civil rights era and the, the invention of, uh, of diversity, if you will, right? And those stories are still being reclaimed. I mean, honestly, I don't even think we talk to our parents and grandparents enough. I know there are still stories I'm learning. Uh, but when you think about the stories that we've lost already, because there have been generations that passed away before there were opportunities to write books and tell stories, uh, that's the single biggest treasure I think that we are missing in our experience. Um. Hi, I'm Chris. Thank you. First, thank you so much for writing this book. It's huge for our culture. Um, been thinking a lot about assimilation theory and how it's impacted kind of this generation of Asian Americans and how it's shaped our culture, our names, anglicized. Um, I'm wondering, and you know, I think there's a lot of reasons for that interracial trauma and like compartmentalizing. I'm wondering what your reflections are on how assimilation theory has impacted then identity and culture. And I mean, I love this stuff Asians like because it's almost like the things that made us other, like reframing that into a joy. But I'm wondering like what your thought process has been, especially in the last year, I think a lot of us are thinking about how to undo a lot of the effects of assimilation theory. And I'm curious if you saw that in the work and, and how that's maybe impacted um, kind of the culture at large. I, I, th I thought you were gonna ask, why, why then, Jeff, do you pronounce your name Yang instead of Yang? <laughs> that's 100% because of assimilation. Anyway, actually, no, it's because of like, it's because of like surrender, frankly, right? Uh, but we can, yeah. Um, I think, okay, I don't even know if I'm going to answer your question with this, but I think that for a long time, it was, it, a lot of people felt like it was a liability to be Asian, to be openly Asian, to be publicly Asian, just get in there and fit in as best as you can, because that's how you're going to survive, right? With this face, best, like, I can't hide this face, so the best thing I can do is try to just fit in where I can, you know, and um, smooth out the edges of my, of my, you know, my Korean name or whatever, you know, and make it easier for everybody else to tolerate my existence, basically. <laughs> um, and I feel like what happens with that is that we let ourselves become invisible. This was done to us, right? We let that happen. We've been invisibilized over many, many decades, and we let that happen. Um, and I think what has happened in recent, oh, it's been a, sort of a recent awakening with, we've become hyper visible, visible in a lot of ways, right? Like when you see these acts of violence and harassment against Asians, um, 
it, you know, all of a sudden we're in the discourse and we're all in like, you know, all of the people just discovered that Asians exist and that we have stories and that we have problems and that this is an issue. Um, and we have no vernacular to talk about that, you know? Um, and so when you go from invisibility and silence to hypervisibility, we, not just everybody else, but we are now relearning the ways to talk about ourselves and finding like, like you know what, like in the case of something like your names, like, it's like, you know what, I'm going to go, but I'm going to ask people to pronounce my name correctly. I like, you know, and I think that there's a minor way in which we, in our day-to-day -day lives, um, sort of find ourselves again, you know, um, I don't know. I, you know, well, okay. Uh, I'll say a couple things on that. The first is in our assimilated future, literally everybody will be named Phil. We're just all going to be named Phil. Um, but uh, I'm number one, though. Right? <laughs> Phil one, <laughs> Phil two. Yeah. Uh, but no, the uh, even even the thing with my own name, which I, I, I it's it's kind of funny that uh, that Phil calls that out because uh, it's something in my family which is is actually a source of some tension, right? Uh, so there are actually two branches of my family in terms of the anglicization of our names. Uh, there's the Yangs and they're the Youngs, right? And the Yangs, Y-A-N-G, are, I mean, well, we're, we're the same family. We're like my parent, it's siblings, my parents, gener my father's generation who decided to go separate ways in terms of how they, how they anglicize. And uh, the Youngs say, uh, we chose the spelling Y-O-U-N-G because it sounds more like the way our name should be pronounced in Chinese, right? Yang, right? Uh, and then the Yangs, they said, we spelled a Y-A-N-G because that looks Asian, <laughs> you know, Y-O-U-N-G. You guys look like you're trying to blend into this other space and you're the ones who are the assimilationists. And, uh, and what it means is that we have these two branches of the family who, who just literally don't look like we're related, even in reunions, and who still sort of like give each is other- Is that your cousin eye. Sam? Yes, Sam oh, Young. <laughs> oh, oh. My, my cousin who was staying in my, my house, Sam Young, when I introduced him, I was like, oh, this is Sam Young, my cousin. Like, I, ju I just put that together. Now, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, but, but that's why there's so much complication around this question of assimilation, right? What does it even mean? Uh, okay, look, I'm gonna, I'll bring up my, my elder son, Hudson Yang, uh, who uh, at the age of eight announced that he wanted to uh, be on TV. And, you know, being a good Asian dad, I, I told him, you know, that's a pretty hard thing to do <laughs> when you're, when you're an Asian kid and when you're Asian and then an Asian male and an Asian male kid in particular, there are like no roles for you. Right. Uh, there were two, it was short round and data from the Goonies. <laughs> played by the same guy. Played by the same guy. And then he disappeared for 20 years until he came back for everything everywhere all at once. Uh, but, you know, he was persistent. And I was like, look, I'm a writer and my parents, you know, rode me hard uh, to try to change my mind. And I said, when I'm a dad, I'm never going to do that. I will support my kids if they want to pursue creative careers, even at the age of freaking eight. <laughs> and so, uh, I took him to an, an, uh, uh, you know, to an open call casting and, uh, you know, it's like to make it all short, right. You know, this kid who I, I spent, you know, quite a while telling him just be conscious of the fact that there's a super hard work. It'll be a lot of disappointments. You know, you will be facing doors slammed in your face. It'll be really hard, but I will support you all the way. I will let you cry on my shoulder, right? Uh, you know, so he gets cast as the lead on a network TV show called Fresh Off the Boat. And uh, the very first thing he said to me was literally, Dad, I thought you said it was gonna be hard. <laughs> uh, but okay, the reason I bring him up, uh, other than to drag him a little and tell him that, tell him that anecdote uh, is, is because uh, that story in particular was designed to in, in kind of destabilize questions about assimilation because so many other stories of Asian American, uh, the few stories really that, that popped up in, you know, about uh, Asian America in, in mainstream uh, storytelling tended to be either about ethnic enclaves, right, where people are kind of limited by the communities that they've chosen or, or retreated to or been defined by, uh, or stories of, you know, Asian Americans who are part of somebody else's narrative, right? Oh, that person's, you know, uh, adopted Asian daughter, that person's Asian wife, that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
there really had not been very many stories of Asian American families, and especially Asian American families who, you know, preserved this sense of being Asian American within the context of a non-Asian environment. And that was fresh off the boat. But more importantly, even within that, Eddie himself, the character Eddie, was somebody who had embraced a different path to assimilation. He decided that because there was no space for an Asian American identity, he embraced hip hop. He kind of, uh, you know, literally and figuratively kind of identified more strongly with the most predominant person of color culture that he could find. And that was black culture, African-American culture. Uh, I don't think that frankly, the, the show fully told that story in the way that I would like to see. I think there were a lot of missing loose trails, uh, you know, that, that could have connected back to why it was, this was an important way to redefine himself. But then again, I wasn't, I was just sitting in the dark waiting for my son to, to come and eat like a cheese stick or something. <laughs> I was not a writer on the show. Uh, yet it, it does, sort of hopefully broaden our sense of what it means to be assimilated. Not all of us, even those of us who were assimilated or grew up in, in cultures that were not Asian American were necessarily automatically assimilated to white culture. There were many people who grew up in urban environments and in, uh, you know, in, in multicultural communities where their most comfortable spaces were not white spaces, but also not Asian American spaces. And, and that's what I think we're really looking at now, a, a bigger and deeper and more complicated conversation about what some of these terms we're, we're engaged with are looking like. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it, it let me mock my son a little bit. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we only have time for one more question. Oh man, oh. it went by so fast. <laughs> okay, if we, is there somebody right who, there? Okay. Hi, I'm Serena, the one with the Wong Fu sweatshirt yeah, on. <laughs> um, my question is, what were some of the defining moments for you where you were like, oh, I'm Asian American? Oh, wow. Um, well, that uh, let me, because uh, I want to explain a little bit. We didn't get to talk about this, but like the way we wrote the book was in the beginning, we were like, all right, we are tasked with telling the story of Asian America for the last 30 years. How do we do that? <laughs> you know, and so what we did was we got us three together and we, we had a, literally, we had a blank spreadsheet and we were like, okay, we asked that question. What are the defining moments of Asian America? What has to go in this book, you know? Um, and so, uh, so read the book. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are certain things where we were like, oh yeah, we have like some things we had to tease out a little bit more. And, and a lot of the time it was like two of us convincing the third, like, no, this is a thing we have to, let's, let's get that in there. But there are some things where we were probably like, oh, yeah, we definitely have to do that. I mean, for me, I'll talk about a moment of joy, like Lin Sanity and the rise of Jeremy Lin, like a moment of just pure magic, fairy tale joy, right? To see, you know, this, this kid, this basketballer just rise up and defy everybody, defy everybody's expectations and just have this, like, it's really like a fairy tale a story, you know, and for, for me, I mean, I'm glad we got that story in the book in Jeremy's own words. We got to talk to him, um, interview him, and then we, we got that illustrated by um, Molly Murakami, who drew the comic for it, and um, it was, it's great, yeah. I, I would say, you know, there, there's sort of the, the backdrop of history that we do cover, uh, even, again, before the 1990s, because it was necessary to capture it. Uh, we have, for instance, a piece about uh, the killing of Vincent Chin, uh, which was the kind of the forging of the modern Asian American kind of political movement. Uh, we had a piece on Wen Ho Lee, you know, which in many ways was, was talking about this larger conversation around being a permanent foreigner in the United States. Uh, we had, uh, you know, round tables where we gathered together, in many cases, people who had not spoken to for a long ass time, sorry, for a long time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like the cast of Better Luck Tomorrow, who, who are scattered across, across different continents, right? Uh, and so we, we reunited them for, for a fantastic conversation that, that Phil presided over. Um, but then there were people who actually were still kind of hanging out every day, like the cast of the Joy Luck Club. <laughs> the Joy, dude, the cast, so we got the four daughters from the Joy Luck, the actresses play the four daughters, um, and, and got them on a Zoom together. Uh, and then they revealed like, they, they have a group chat, you know, that they have like, you know, Talent to Meet is apparently a notorious late night texter. But like, 
but that that's, that zoom started with the the the, the women being like ming na show us your new your your bathroom <laughs> your newly remodeled bathroom she's like oh she took the laptop it's like showing us like check it out i it's was like, like this is the bidet i was <laughs> like wow okay uh that was fun <laughs> I mean, you know, the 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 there was the sort of cultural moments, the political and historical moments, um, personal moments too. And I think, you know, in that question of what what was that moment that made you feel like you're, you know, for the first time, first time truly kind of, I guess, Asian American, you know, uh, in, in my essay I, I write about, uh, and you quoted part of it, right? So there was this moment uh, when I was a kid in New York, uh, not a kid, an adult, a young adult in New York, um, where. Uh, where I just realized that I was in this sort of unique space where I was I was about to walk into uh, a, a room of coworkers, you know, a room of people who are making this magazine with me, who are Asian American. Uh, I'd seen a lot of them the night before because we were at a fundraiser for, uh, you know, APA Heritage Month. Uh, we'd organized actually uh, a, a comedy festival, which Margaret Cho was actually the headliner for. I, there was like this. I remember a magical moment where it felt like uh, I was leaving Asian America, walking through Asian America, and then walking into Asian America. And, and in New York, where there are so many fragmented spaces and so many diverse people, and it often feels like you're alone in every crowd, that I think that one moment, which I kind of wrote about there, uh, was, was the one that crystallized for me, that this was not the family that I was born into, but it was like the extended family I chose. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it was a space that was both creative and challenging and provocative and productive. And it was a moment that for that moment, I think, you know, would be hard to recapture again. So it, it, it's, it's a little harder to find, but uh, I just remember that one morning uh, when I was walking to work and then realizing myself, I'm actually here. This is it. I'm standing in Asian America. You know. Um, so I hated the groan that went up in the audience when I said it was the last question. So one more. <laughs> um, anybody? No. Oh, that's the last one. <laughs> all right. Claim your space. Nice shirt, man. Oh, yeah. thank you. Oh, first of all, <laughs> welcome to Jersey. I'm so glad you guys made it cross country. Uh, happy belated birthday, Phil. I'm a tourist oh, as well. Uh, my question is, how did you guys come up with the title for the book? Um, was it a big debate amongst your three? I would imagine you had to do the book justice and it's as complex as like naming your firstborn, right? So <laughs> how did we settle on Rise? Like, you know, it there was a lot, lot of workshopping, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we came back and forth. I mean, I think Rise was the early working title and uh, we just never found anything better. <laughs> you know, at one point we we're joking, we just make it into a cookbook and call it Rice. Uh, <laughs> Hot recipes from Asian America, because um, you know if you're Asian American, you got to name like eighty percent of your stuff after food. <laughs> it's like that seems to be the rule. But no, I, I, th I think Rise. Uh, when we realized that what we were really talking about was was this kind of emergence from invisibility, you know, Rise felt, felt like it. Uh, Rise felt it like like it fit, and it's also kind of an, a bit of an homage, right? I mean, I think that when we think of of the term Rise. Uh, we our our mind does go back to to like Maya Angelou, you know, and and the African American community's embrace of rising as a, a form of of both celebration and resistance. And it, yes, you know, we didn't want to step on that, but we didn't want to pay homage to it because one of the things we we do remind people at the very beginning of the book is that the Asian the term Asian American, right, the very idea of being Asian American, first and foremost was an act of solidarity with the Black community and resistance against uh, the, the forces that tried to divide us. And uh, that's because the term Asian American was coined by a group of Berkeley students, right? You know, in the Bay Area, uh, who wanted to stand in solidarity, to march in solidarity with uh, protesters fighting for the release of Huey Newton, with black students who were fighting to, to release the Black Panther leader. And it's just that they were, you know, students of the Asian diaspora who didn't have any literal banner to march under. So they created this banner that said Asian American Political <clears throat> Alliance, first time in public that that term was used and coined. And it was done specifically because Asian Americans want to march with black Americans. And I think we forget that too often. And I think that those ties and that coalition building is so critical 
to our continued growth and expansion and, and rise as a community. So the backstory to that, it, it connects to, to that history as well. Thanks for that question though.